what's the point? Uh, why should I follow such a book that says slavery is fine, killing is fine, and a lot of other absurd things that I don't, I don't believe in? These atheists try to debunk the Bible by saying that it is a 2000 year old book. So make sure to watch till the end because I have a Bible verse that will tie all of this together and shout out the clip and give me an answer. They're amazing. We love them. Let's get into it. You have the written record, the historical record of how Christ performed the miracles, how he died, how he rose from the dead. So you got a ton of eyewitness testimony. Sure, I suppose. But I think um, there can be things that are written that are not true. Yes, obviously. Correct. Absolutely correct. And, and, and even more than that, I think the things that are written in the Bible are, are things that people have a hard time believing, such mm -hmm. as miracles. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I suppose it would be one thing if it were just something like uh, nothing that seemed to be like uh, something I had never seen before. Right. So it's hard for me to believe that things like miracles happened a long, long time ago when I, I have no evidence for that today. Okay, then we got to think carefully at, the, at this point. It's a good, hard issue you're raising. If it happened all the time, we might not call it a miracle. Sure. Right? So we got to remember that the Gospels are, are like ESPN highlights. The Bible is not saying, oh, miracles just used to happen every five minutes. There was a miracle. Right? Rather, the Gospels are sort of the highlights. The Bible is sort of giving us the highlights. The Bible's not saying, oh, by the way, every five minutes you can see a supernatural miracle occur. Sure, but highlights on ESPN are a lot different. I mean, we have like a video cameras that actually are able to show us what happened, right? We don't have anything like that for the miracles that supposedly happened back then. It's completely right. different. Good. But at this fine university, you have a department of history. And historical knowledge is a legitimate form of knowledge. And it's not based on having it on video. Sure. It's based on the reliability of eyewitness testimony. Somebody saw Abraham Lincoln assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. They wrote it down. And you guys got to pay a fair amount of money to study history. It's a legitimate form of knowledge. Sure, but I think there's I think there's a difference between somebody being assassinated and something like uh, somebody ascending to the heavens. Yes. So, so, so in so in one case, I think I have good reasons to believe that somebody, if they were to have a gun and they were to shoot somebody, that they would die if the bullet went into their brain. Even though I've never seen anybody shoot anybody with a gun, I think that would happen. I think I have good reasons to believe that that would happen. But it's different for the other case where you say that somebody ascended up into the heavens. Okay, good point. So, you're obviously then getting to a philosophical issue, which is, is there a supernatural God, in which case miracles are possible, or is there no supernatural God, in which case obviously miracles are impossible? Sure. So do you think there's a supernatural God, or do you think there's no supernatural God? I think it's possible that there's a God, but even if they were, there were a God, I don't see why I would believe that these miracles happened back then. Cool. If you allow for the existence of a supernatural God, then miracles are not irrational. Miracles are simply the supernatural God who created the natural order, choosing to change that natural order and perform what you and I call a miracle. For instance, if you and I are standing under an apple tree, 100 times out of 100, if the apple loosens and falls from the branch, it hits the ground. But if a hand is introduced, and if my hand catches that falling apple, then it will not hit the ground. Now, 100 times out of 100, the laws of nature work. And God created those laws of nature. But the God who created those laws of nature is more than capable of intervening, changing that, the introduction of a hand, and changing a law of nature. That's a miracle. Sure, but... but wow, that's good. I like that illustration. Yeah, if he believes in God, then there's no reason why there can't be a supernatural thing to happen for a miracle. To his point, it's easier to believe that someone got assassinated because you see that happening all the time and you know that's possible. But for a miracle, maybe you haven't seen some miracles. I know I have, and it's changed my life. So let's continue. Even if, it, if God's capable of doing something like that, it doesn't follow that he does anything like that. Okay. Okay, so what is the criteria that you would use to determine whether God did perform a miracle or not? How would you determine that? I don't really know. Well, the only way I know is have someone witness it and then write 
about what they saw. Sure, I suppose. But I mean, do I have license to believe any sort of supernatural thing has happened if I ever get a no. historical account of it? No, you better put together some tests that you use to distinguish between what's historically reliable and what's not historically reliable. I mean, you're right, there's a lot of fiction. But the reason that you have a history department here is because not all writing is fiction. There's nonfiction. There's historically reliable documents. Sure, but I, I suppose there's lots of books that, that are out there waiting to be tested, right? Not just the Bible, but all sorts of other accounts Absolutely. Of, of, of supposed miracles. Uh huh. But I guess, I mean, is it, a, is it incumbent upon me to change my major, to start studying history, to really find out whether or not this is true? No. No, it's not incumbent upon you that you become a history major. But what is incumbent upon you is to search for God the same way Thomas did. And when you bump up against Jesus Christ, you will notice that this is not simply a philosophical or ethical discussion that Christ engages us in. He makes some incredible claims to be God in human form, to be the resurrection of the life, and then he says, and by the way, guys, I'm going to die and rise from the dead. Now, if he didn't rise from the dead, he's a liar, because he said he was going to. If he does rise from the dead, then the evidence is you and I should trust him. So that's why you've got to put together some tests that you use to determine historical reliability to ascertain whether those Gospels are mythology, fiction, or whether they're non-fiction, historical narrative. Sure, but I guess whether or not the Bible is historically accurate, I mean, that seems to be a, a, something that lots of people disagree upon. It's something that people have devoted their entire life to either proving or disproving, and still everybody is throwing their hands up in the air, not knowing whether or not it's true. It's what, it's what it seems to be. I mean, you, you say that it's true, but other people say that it's not true. Okay, what year do we live in? 2010 or 11. I'm not After sure. what? After... 2010, years after the birth of Christ. Do you really think that a large number of educated people question the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth as a real person? Uh, no, I think most people believe that he was a person. Right. Okay, so there's overwhelming historical evidence that Jesus really lived. Now, obviously, the hard question is, did he really rise from the dead? Okay, but watch out. The overwhelming historical evidence is that he did live. We live in the year 2010, 2010 years after the birth of this historical Jesus of Nazareth. So I think we all would have to agree the guy did live. I get it. I would say that lots of people say that it's not true is based off of them not wanting to follow God's commands. I would say in a, in a sense, yeah, they don't believe essentially, but you have to at least admit Jesus was a real person. And then you go down the path. Was he really who he said he was, and then did the things really happen that he claimed would happen. And when you find out how the disciples reacted to Jesus after he died and then resurrected and how they literally gave up themselves and died so that Jesus' glory can be known, not for their own glory. Who does that? For, for someone else's glory. Not unless they see that he really did resurrect. The question is, did he really rise from the dead? Now, watch out for your philosophical presupposition. Because if your philosophical presupposition is, there's no supernatural God, therefore miracles don't happen, then of course Christ didn't rise from the dead. Sure, but that's not my presupposition, right? Good. Okay. So you're open to the possibility that he rose from the dead. So, put together some tests that you use to determine historical reliability. Now, if you want to, I'll tell you the tests that I use. But there's nothing sacred about my test. That's why I encourage you, put together your own test. The test that I use are four in number. First test I ask is, how many manuscripts do we have of the document? You know, we've played the game telephone. We've sat in a circle. We've whispered a, ear in a secret into the ear of the person next to us. They've whispered into the ear of the person seated next to them. And by the time the secret reaches the end of the circle, it's totally perverted, right? But that's not how we have the Gospels today. The Gospels that we have today in English are based on over 5,000 Greek manuscripts or pieces of manuscript, 8,000 Latin manuscripts translated by Jerome in the 5th century, thousands of manuscripts from Coptic, Aram Aramean translators. So we have a plethora 
of manuscripts of the New Testament. What do we have for Aristotle, Plato, Caesar, Tacitus, Thucydides, Herodotus? At the most, 20 manuscripts for a particular work of theirs. But for the New Testament, over 5,000. Doesn't mean it's true, but what it does mean is we got to take this thing seriously because the manuscript evidence is overwhelmingly supporting its sure, reliability. There's things in Herodotus that we don't take seriously. There's lots of uh, supernatural stuff in, in the things that he recounts. Mm -hmm. Most people don't believe in those things, right? Right. Even not Christians because it's Greek myth. Correct, because the literary style is mythology. But when you study the New Testament Gospels, you'll realize the literary style is not mythology. It's historical narrative. It reads like the New York Times or the LA Times. Let me, give, let me give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. Luke chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Iturea and Traconitus, and Lysanias Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John. To tell you the truth, sir, I could give a rip about who was Tetrarch and who was governor. But what you can't mistake is the literary style is historical narrative. You go back to the Roman records and you see that this guy, Luke, who wrote this, is a meticulous historian. He had all his Tetrarchs, all his governors accurately in place. So that's the literary style, not mythology, not epic poetry like Homer's Iliad or Odyssey, but historical narrative backed up with thousands of manuscripts. The second test I use is, what's the gap between the writing of the document and the first manuscript that we have? For Aristotle, Plato, Caesar, Tacitus, Thucydides, Herodotus, the gap is 700 to 1400 years between the time it was written and the first manuscript that we have. The gap between the Gospel of John, written between 60 and 90 AD, and the first manuscript that we have, located in the John Rylands University Library in Manchester, England, is a gap of 30 to 60 years. Wow. So those other manuscripts, historians type people, are, are, are 700 to 1400 years? That's crazy. But for Jesus, for the manuscript, wow. That is absolutely insane how close that is to Jesus when he was alive. That is mind-blowing. The Bodmer Manuscript which contains the first 14 chapters of the Gospel of John in Geneva, Switzerland, is dated 200 AD. So that's 120 years after the writing. You see, the gap between the writing and the extant manuscripts is so small that we have incredibly high degree of certainty that we really have what they wrote. <coughs> Third test. Within 150 years of the life of the most famous person of Jesus' day, Tiberius Caesar, the Roman emperor, how many people wrote about Tiberius Caesar? 10. Within 150 years of the life of Christ, how many people wrote about Jesus? 42. That's pretty impressive. This yes. is an historical guy who really lived. Fourth test. When you read the Gospels, look for detail. Because if someone's lying and they give too much detail, they've made a big mistake because we can check up on them. For instance, the Gospels record that Jesus was buried, not just in any tomb, but in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And he was a leader. He was a leading politician of his day. So everybody knew where the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea was. And the Gospel writers say, Jesus was, born in the, was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, which means, if you don't think the tomb is empty, go and check it out. It's well known. People go to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, it's empty. The body of Christ is not there. So it's due to those types of details that give the Gospels great credibility. So those are some of the tests that I use to determine historical reliability. But nothing sacred about my tests. If you don't like them, I'm not going to be offended. But you've got to come up with your own test that you consistently use to determine what's fiction, what's non-fiction, what's credible and what's not credible. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, man, you got to put your faith in him because he's the truth. Yes, if it's true, I think that's how they put so much detail into things that were happening and it was true. People could verify it. There's a reason why so many people became Christians.
okay? It's not like, oh, they, a lot of people were like, oh, that's, that's just a myth. A lot of people became Christians, <laughs> and they were able to verify, oh, yeah, the tomb is actually empty. That's right, but I think still the point in question is whether or not it's true, whether I have reasons to believe it's true, even if it is, or, or whether or not it isn't. Yep. Um, I suppose, yes, it, uh, Maybe the Gospels are written in a narrative historical style, mm -hmm. but I think it's still a question as to whether or not they're reporting something that's true or false. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm still uh, thinking about the fact that there's historians, experts, that say that it is historically accurate and say that it isn't historically accurate. For me, I suppose, and I have a lot of work still to do to go and check these things to see whether or not they're true, right? Whether they're making mistakes. It seems like it would be a lot of work that I would have to do. <clears throat> Oh, it's not that much. The Gospels are about 160 pages. Read them, put together your test to determine historicity, and then be able to explain why you reject them as fiction, or why you trust them as historically reliable, and why you put your faith in Christ. But please don't be a cynic just saying, oh no, I don't believe. Well, I mean, I, I do feel somewhat like a cynic. I think, yeah, even if I do read this stuff, I'm afraid that I'm still gonna be in this position where my hands are up in the air, and I just really don't know. Okay, well, if your hands are up in the air, and if it's because you've done a study and the, the evidence is lacking, obviously the question you've got to answer is, what am I living for, and what is the evidence that so surpasses the evidence for the reliability of Christ that I'm living for whatever it is I'm living for? Because obviously, sir, you're going to have to live for something. You are right now living for something. You know, you wouldn't be... Yeah, that's... What's more true that I'm living for? Like... If you don't want to live for Jesus, what's more true? What's what's a better evidence not to live for Jesus? What's a better evidence for the thing that you are living for? Is there greater evidence for there not to be a God? No. You have to have more faith to believe that there is not a God. Be a student here if you weren't a highly, highly motivated person. <laughs> you wouldn't be articulating as clearly and well as you do if you hadn't put some thought into it. You're a motivated person. Okay, all you got to do is ask, my, ask yourself, what motivates me? And whatever it is that motivates you, well, that's the object of your faith. That's what you believe in. You can't prove it's the purpose of your life, but it's you've chosen to say this is worth my work, my money, my effort. I'm going to live for this. See, now you got to ask yourself, okay, now why? Why have I made that decision? What's the evidence? Because you're a skeptic, right? So am I. What's the evidence that whatever it is you're living for is reliable? That's good. So now this guy's the one who says... What's the point of believing in a book that's 2,000 years old? Let's get into it see what he says. What's the point? Uh, why should I follow such a book that says slavery is fine, killing is fine, and a lot of other absurd things that I don't, I don't believe in? And let's put that aside. This was 2,000 years ago in the 21st century. Why, need I, why do I need to follow that such a thing? Give me five reasons that I need to have a religion. You want five reasons that you need to have a religion? Yeah, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in any religion, and I'm a decent person. I'm I'm in morality. I, you know, I have morality. I'm I'm ethical guy. And mm -hmm. In fact, I'm more ethical than a lot of religious people. I believe you. Okay. So give me five reasons I need to have a religion. You bet. First reason that you need to believe in Christ and God is, you've got to answer the question, as a thinking human being, where do I come from? Mm -hmm. Because that has profound implications. Where do you think I come from? I think you come from God. Okay, well, uh, why should I think you're right when most of scientists don't think that way? You know, if, if this is something that science can answer, and most of sci science, scientists don't believe what you believe, I'm going to go with the scientists who actually know what they're talking about. I want to say most scientists, uh, maybe famous ones. Sir, science is a study of process, right? how the organism works. Science does not answer the question, is there an intelligent mind behind the process or is there no intelligent mind behind the process? That is a philosophical question, not a scientific question. And if any scientist stands up in class and says, I can scientifically prove that God exists, you better tell no, their department head. That. Exactly. They can't prove that Equally, God if somebody, either. if some scientist stands up in their class and says, science proves that God does not exist, you better also hand them into their department head. Science is not concerned with the question, does God exist or not? Right. That is a philosophical, theological question. Right. Let me give an example. Scientists are not claiming there is a God. 
and you guys are people who are claiming there is such a such a thing it's like i say there's a chocolate under that table well i'm claiming that i'm the one who has to prove that you shouldn't you shouldn't disprove that there is no chocolate on your table. If you're claiming there is a God, so you're the one who needs to, to prove to me that there is a God. That's another question, sir. I'm trying to answer your first question. And I respect you, and that's why I'm trying to the best of my ability to answer your first question. You asked me to give you, and we'll get to the science issue if you want to, all right? Sure. But your first question was, give me five reasons why this is important that I should believe in Christ, in God. And my first point was, you have to answer the question, we all do. Where do I come from? Why? Because if I'm a cosmic accident, then to argue that I have worth, value, and significance is a joke. It's an exercise in futility. Because if I am simply primordial slime evolved to a higher order, then to act like I have innate value is an exercise in fantasy. I don't have any value. I'm a cosmic accident. That's all you are, if there is no God. What do you see your value in? What's your value? So you're suggesting, if I don't believe in God, I don't have any value. I don't know what I'm doing in, in this planet? No. If there is no God, none of us have innate value. If in reality there is no God, we're all pawn scum evolved to a higher order. Yeah, that's good. And we're not saying that atheists don't have any value. We're saying with your viewpoint, you wouldn't have any value. But with God, we believe there's a God. That means you have intrinsic value because you are made in the image of God. Which means we don't have any innate intrinsic worth. We just exist. Now, we can go around saying, I am the greatest. I am the greatest. But that's a fantasy. That's an illusion. Because in reality, I'm not the greatest. I'm just pun scum evolved to a higher order. So are you suggesting the only reason people do good you no, know. that's ethics. That's different. We're talking about human worth. Why is a human being valuable? That's valuable to me. If I do good to someone, if I help someone that doesn't have food to eat, that's valuable to me. That's why I'm here. I help other people if they need help. That's. I don't see why you say that's not valuable if I don't believe in God. Should I just do that because I'm scared there's a hell and I might burn the hell? Or, I mean, no, 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 no. What do you see the value in? Listen to me, sir. You're not listening. Human beings are not innately worth anything. They're pawn scum evolved to a higher order. That's now, my, my worldview, the worldview of Jesus Christ is, this man is not simply pawn scum evolved to a higher order. He's a human being created in the image of God for a purpose. And because God has given him worth and value, he has innate value. And it doesn't come from him running around saying, I am the greatest, I am the greatest, I am the greatest. No, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact he's not a cosmic accident. He's a human being created by God for a purpose. Okay, so that's the first reason you should seriously consider Christ. Okay. The second reason you should seriously consider Christ is because if atheism is true, then life is absurd. It's meaningless. And that's what Camus and Sartre and Nietzsche point out very clearly. Sartre begins his novel, L'Etranger, The Stranger, with the words of a young teenage boy who says, yesterday mother died. Or was it today? Who cares when mom dies? Death simply ends the absurdity that birth began. Jesus Christ says, no. Life is not absurd. It's not meaningless. It has a purpose. And God gave you this gift of life for the purpose of loving and worshiping God and loving and serving other people. So that's the second reason you should seriously consider Christ. The third reason that you should seriously consider Christ is because you're a good atheist. You're an altruistic, moral atheist. But as Nietzsche points out, you don't have the courage to face the fact that if you do the opposite of what you define as good, that's just as good because morality is relative. Which means, maybe you think it's good to feed the guy a meal, but if you instead choose to steal his money, that's your choice. It's not evil. Are you suggesting I get my morality from religion? Is that what you're going to No. I'm saying, if there is no God, morality is relative. Which means, it doesn't matter whether you slit his throat or feed him dinner. It's your choice, and whatever you choose is your choice. It's not good. It's not evil. 
It's all relative, arbitrary, ephemeral. Right. But if there is a God, then it's possible that there's a value of justice and a value of love. And you better not slit his throat. If you're able to feed him if he's hungry, you better feed him if he's hungry. First of all, I was talking about religion, not God. That's the first thing. And so don't bring that God argument into this. It's a complete different thing here. Oh, I you're absolutely an, right. So I'm saying, why do I need religion? Because, you don't. You know, you say... You do not you need say, religion. You say Christian is the best, the Muslim guys say Islam is the best, and you know, whoever has its religion say that's the best, you should follow this because this is He says Jesus is the best. He says Jesus is there's Jesus is the reason to believe that there's a God. Jesus is the reason to believe that he's the best evidence. The best. Why should I follow any religion? That's you should do not follow religion. Follow Jesus Christ, not religion. Religion has been used has been used to justify the Crusades, the Inquisition, the Salem witch trials enslaving African Americans, I think you'd be an idiot to follow religion. Jesus Christ is totally different from religion. So now I have a Bible verse that will tie all of this together. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. So guys, go to Jesus today. today. He Know that he loves you and he's longing to have a relationship with you. If you haven't decided to follow Jesus, I encourage you to admit that you're a sinner. We've all fallen short. But with Jesus, he can save us. So believe that he died on the cross and rose again in three days so that you can be saved. I encourage you to do that today. Make him your Lord and Savior. That means live for him for the rest of your life. Do that today. That would be the best decision. In the description below, you can click the link to help you decide to follow Jesus. Do that today. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please like this video and subscribe. I love and appreciate you all for being here and supporting me. Have an amazing day. Peace.